Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. It's brought to you by the World Puja Network, and I am Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm joined today uh, by Linda Willits, who has been uh, with us for many years on expeditions with uh, CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the uh, amazing contact experiences we've had all over the world. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the recent events that have happened here in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the Blue Ridge Mountains on the training that we had here a few weeks ago and also the events that have happened recently in uh, Joshua Tree National Park where we will be having an expedition beginning on November 2nd. And there are still a couple uh, places open for trainees and that if uh, people are interested they can go to uh, cseti.org seti.org and uh, join us for that expedition up to the Joshua Tree Wilderness, uh, which begins November 2nd. Thank you, Linda, for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. It's great to be here. Great. Well, uh, why don't you uh, sort of introduce some things that uh, that uh, you, you noted as you're the official recorder of events for the expeditions uh, that happened in uh, Charlottesville uh, this year and, and other years and just sort of introduce it to folks. Well, I was just checking through my notes, um, and one of the most amazing things that happened in Charlottesville that um, that we haven't seen as often in other locations is we had a craft flashing, in, or several craft actually, between between two and four crafts flashing and interacting with us almost every night of the training. Actually, it happened every night except the first night, and um, it's possible even that first night we didn't notice it. But interacting with us for an hour or more every night, and they were so tuned into our consciousness that as soon as we broke for the night, they stopped flashing. And they were interactive with us. Um, when Dr. Greer would flash his laser at them, they would often respond. Um, they flashed with with some periodicity, but not exactly on schedule, and they um we had a videographer that was that had his camera on them the whole time and that's how we knew exactly when they stopped flashing because his camera was running the whole night well yes with the uh third generation night scope binoculars that we've just hooked up to this digital camera and we're getting amazing footage and this was a an object in space but it was very very bright you could see it with the naked eye and it would move in and take up position and sometimes there'd be three or four of them in the same area of the sky, like a little flotilla of them, and they would stay there upwards of an hour to an hour and a half. And what was interesting about this is that whenever we would take a break as a group, they would stop. And then we'd rejoin, it'd come back. And this is all filmed, by the way, with this digital camera. It's ext- it was very, very much keyed in to exactly what we were doing. And um, uh, it was a very bright, kind of diamond white object. Uh, that was in the uh, uh, south, southern skies, uh, up about uh, you know 40 to 60 degrees elevation. Uh, we also had a couple like that that did that and then started moving. Uh, and one of the really interesting events that happened is that we had a, a brilliant object. In fact, there were two of them that came right into the atmosphere to the west and flew right. Uh, I mean, you can almost hear them. Uh, and then came right across the the western sky but between us and the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains uh, that were to our west. And we had a number of these sorts of events that happened uh, throughout the week, and it was just a wonderful uh, group of people here at our farm. Um, and that It was just so amazing. And, you know, another thing that seemed to be somewhat related to the um, the crafts in the southwestern sky uh, was the, the fog, which on... Um, the one, the first night that the fog appeared was the same, the second night in the field, and that was the same night that the the flashing crafts appeared in the southwest. And as we were breaking to leave the circle, we were suddenly, like within 10 to 15 seconds, it had been clear, we were suddenly engulfed in a thick, heavy fog that just happened, you know, within seconds. And we were a little concerned for the people that were going to be driving away from the area, but they reported back the next day that the fog was only over our field site and, you know, your farm. It was nowhere else on their way home. Well, and, and interestingly, people had these um, 
sort of orbs or brilliant objects follow them back to their hotel rooms. And uh, a couple of people had them in their rooms and even had them turning on and off the lights. That's the, right. Uh, which we've had happen before, sort of a way that the, there's some indication, uh, sort of electromagnetic anomalies that happen. And, I, of course, we point out to people that, you know, really advanced interstellar civilizations uh, that are, are capable of moving faster than the speed of light uh, and are f- resonating in a form faster than solid matter uh, can manifest in amazing ways. And uh, some of the people who were on this training did not know that. They were expecting sort of a Hollywood Steven Spielberg movie type thing. And there's, there began to be all these sort of intimate, uh, very close-range events that happened not only at the site, but also as people would then leave because the whole purpose of these uh, expeditions are to introduce people to the fact that we're not alone and that people would become ambassadors um, from Earth to these civilizations. And part of that tutorial, I I call it a a cosmic tutorial that takes place, is uh, people begin to have uh, these experiences with these uh, ET beings and uh, their sub-technologies that becomes very personal. And and a number of people not only had uh, amazing lucid dreams with these beings, but also would then have these electromagnetic uh, events and uh, orbs and scintillating areas of lights that would be in their vehicles or be in their uh, rooms when they would return back from the site. So this became, I tell people, it becomes a uh, 24-hour-a-day event because uh, it's something where we involve not only the, the, what we're doing out uh, under the stars at night uh, on these expeditions, but also uh, in the level of deep consciousness and higher states of consciousness, the experience that then crosses over into uh, dream time and into uh, the ability to remote view and have a consciousness awareness of these uh, civilizations and these specific extraterrestrial beings. And uh, we also had an amazing, uh, very close uh, fly-in of this uh, sort of bluish-white craft, this ET craft we call Kindness, uh, because there is an ET on board it that we have seen that is this really uh, beautiful, kind, uh, female extraterrestrial life form. And this craft is, is very distinctive when it comes in uh, and is a uh, brilliant uh, diamond white, bluish in, uh, color craft, and uh, that was uh, present also on more than one evening that would come into the sky and then move back out into space. You can actually see it move back out into space after it comes in um, and was seen by everyone. Uh, so these were all events that happened over the course of the five nights that we were out under the stars. You know, Another thing about the fog was the, the next night, the fog was so tuned into our energy that every time we would take a break or get you know get up and we we had a few breaks during during the evening and then when we broke for the final um end of the night the fog would swoop down within seconds and engulf our group and as soon as we sat down and resumed our field work and got back into consciousness it would disappear just as quickly right right and there was also a, a really interesting, several people had daytime sightings of these uh, disks. Uh, we had come in one afternoon uh, from sort of doing a hike out here uh, on the ridge um, about four miles and um, sitting on our, our patio here facing west towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, uh, that night I had had a very br- a lucid dream of a, a brilliant craft with a sort of a a golden red corona around it that came out of this mountain called Humpback Mountain. And it's it's well known that there have been a lot of sightings of these ET craft of emerging from the earth in that area. And sat down and looked, and, and just for a few seconds, a disc uh, about an inch at arm's length in size, but, but between the mountain and our location, appeared uh, like a, a, a magenta... A peach-colored uh, sphere of electricity that just uh, shimmered and came in, and it, it was really quite amazing. And uh, you know, this whole event was preceded the week before by my wife and I being outside on our patio, and it was a very clear day. 
and we looked straight up, and there was a uh, disc that was the, exactly like a rainbow, but there, it was a clear day. And it was a rainbow disc, and I call it that because the way they shift when they're going faster than the speed of light, they can leave uh, sort of an essence in three-dimensional space-time that can refract the light. Sometimes, at a certain angle, it'll look like a heat wave or a fog uh, at night. But this was exactly like a discrete disc-shaped rainbow just right above our, our patio and house. And we both saw it, and the clouds that were moving, above, a couple of clouds moving above it, would actually, you could see through this with this rainbow color, and it would make the, the clouds look like rainbow colored as they moved past it. Then there was a strange small, like a Learjet, that had an AWACS communication system that came zooming in right after this happened. And then uh, another jet that circled the house for about an hour and a half to two hours. It was a military. So apparently whatever this was was picked up on someone's scope. But um, we had uh, this, this started happening the week before everyone gathered here for this uh, expedition a couple of weeks ago at, at here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And um, we just had a wonderful group of people and a very, very uh, great group of people who are going to go back and, and then practice these protocols that involve you know, the use of uh, lasers and high-powered uh, 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 these electromagnetic tones that we've recorded um, f from the ETs, as well as uh, the ability to, to remote view and, and vector them into sight using consciousness. And they're going to go back to, to all their areas. We had people from Malaysia here. We had people from uh, Europe uh, and from Canada and all over the United States. And it was just a, a wonderful group of people. You know, um, another thing about the the crafts that you saw coming out of Humpback Mountain in your meditation was after you did the puja the uh, fourth night, fourth evening, you did it right at sunset in the field, and then you, you were giving people their mantras um, over away from our circle that we were sitting in in the field, and I was in the circle and watching the sunset, and out of Humpback Mountain there were clouds three clouds in the shape and the same color you described of of um et craft and the clouds were positioned or the crafts were positioned at, they looked like they were coming right out of humpback mountain in the sunset right it was very beautiful it was yeah and what linda is referring to is that we always have an evening where we uh, gather and i do a puja a sanskrit uh, vedic puja and then teach people meditation uh, with a, a very special mantra that's on the meditation CD that we have, uh, that's available on our website um, and uh, disclosureproject.org. Uh, you can order that, and it's a two-hour CD that's an instruction um, manual for meditation, and then also this really amazing mantra that uh, is tonal, and which has an amazing effect for people to transcend into. Um, uh, cosmic awareness and be able to then rapidly be able to remote view distant places and uh, distant objects and, and of course uh, make contact with these visitors. You know, this the reason the consciousness sciences are so key is that uh, we know that the main way that these extraterrestrial civilizations uh, have uh, developed uh, communication technologies is that they do have machinery as it were, very advanced electronics, but they interface directly with consciousness and thought. And so if you go into this non-local uh, universal field of awareness that is the nature of the mind that's within all of us, uh, then what you can do is operate on a level where you can not only see them but then communicate and show them through very coherent, clear thought uh, uh, and, and images, your location. So you kind of zoom them in from space right to wherever your research team is located. And we call this a coherent thought sequencing, where the, the thought is like coherent light is, like a laser is coherent light. This is coherent thought, but within this uh, foundation of cosmic awareness. And so the first thing that we emphasize is the experience of the development of uh, the meditative faculty, the ability to sit quietly, go into unbounded awareness, remote view, 
uh, different distinct, distinct uh, places. And we actually do exercises where we teach people uh, exercises of how to do this remote viewing very accurately, where they can prove to themselves this is possible. And, and then uh, throughout the week, people become clearer and clearer and clearer at being able to do that. And uh, so uh, it, it is a process. And we'll be doing this, of course, at Joshua Tree on November 2nd, uh, where during the day we, we basically go through the uh, information and go through the meditation process and instruction and discussion. And then at night we actually go out under the stars and uh, make a circle and, and meditate and use our lasers and other equipment but also have the group go into this deep state of cosmic consciousness together, which is very powerful to have 30 or 40 people in that state of awareness, and then make contact. And we have the most amazing things that then transpire, uh, like the events here and the events that happened at Shasta uh, in September last month. And, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, in November, uh, we'll be doing this again up in the Joshua Tree Wilderness, which will be wonderful. Uh, we're going to be staying right near the west entrance to uh, Joshua Tree National Park, and uh, we have a site there in the center of Joshua Tree uh, that was shown to us by the ETs because the first year, in fact, the very first year Linda was involved it was, it was when we had this amazing uh, uh, event happen. I mean, maybe you want to share that with folks, um, how we got introduced to the whole Joshua Tree uh, site and, and, and why we go to where we go in Joshua Tree, Linda. Yeah, that was amazing. It was in 1996 in November, and we had been out um, down this one particular road we use in, in the National Park, and we had been further down the road than we've ever gone since. And we'd had a lot of activity out there, and as we were leaving, it was about 1.30 in the morning, and uh, Dr. Greer had said that there was going to be something really amazing and dramatic and very quick happen. And as we were driving out, I was driving um, in my vehicle right behind his, and out straight down from the from the sky, I could see it in a totally panoramic view of it through my windshield, was a beautiful teal. It was like fluorescent teal, and and with a little white um, craft the size of my fist came down, and. It was in the shape of a kind of a Hershey's Kiss, where, where where the paper comes off at the top. It was a little bit of like white, but mostly it was teal and just brilliant. And you could see it go like straight into the ground in the in the desert in the distance. And it wasn't that far. It was maybe a, about a mile away, and it totally illuminated the whole desert floor. But it didn't make a sound, and it and it merged. It disappeared into the desert floor. Right, and in fact, what was interesting, seconds before it appeared, and this is a very large craft, it had to be two or 300 feet in diameter at that distance to be that size. If you hold your fist out in front of you at arm's length and see how big that object is, I mean, airplanes are the size of part of your pinky nail up in, up in the sky. This is a huge object. It came straight down. Um, it didn't come down at an angle. It just felt like a dead weight and went straight into the earth. And, you know, you would think that there would have been an enormous explosion or something. And because it did illuminate the desert floor, you could actually see the rocks and the trees and right. and the hills uh, as it illuminated the, the desert. And we're out in the middle of nowhere in the heart of uh, the deepest uh, part of the interior of Joshua Tree National Park when this happened. And um, I was knew that they were showing us where they have a underground ET facility that's in the National Park. Um, and it's this site that we now go to every year, and that's where we're going to be on November 2nd for a week uh, and for six nights going out to this amazing place where uh, we have had uh, just a stunning contact with uh, these uh, beings and, and with these craft. And, uh, in fact, uh, where we have actually had a craft emerge from that same area, the same uh, field, uh, where this big one went in a couple of years ago, we had one that fully materialized about 10 to 20 feet above us and came over 
the group right above the height of the Joshua tree that that we sit beside, and it made this most unusual sound. Uh, it, it was wow 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 like that, and it, it, you know the whole group was sort of stunned. That's and awesome. uh, it's at the same site that uh, last year we were there, and had this brilliant object came right over the center of the circle, and we were in meditation, and it and it and it put so much it flashed so brightly. And it wasn't just light; it was like a, it was like an energetic, celestial energy is, is the best way to describe it. That everyone felt instantly elevated and energized. But people who had their eyes closed could actually see the light that made so much brightness that they could see the veins in their eyelids. I mean, right. this is like it was like ten feet over us. And so we go to this site now where we have these amazing events happen, and where people are really initiated into being ambassadors to the universe. Uh, because we know that uh, even though the governments of the world have only dealt with this issue in a, in a secretive way, and there are no international organizations openly doing what we're doing, that we now have thousands of people that we are trained all over the world. I mean, like I said, from uh, China and Malaysia and Australia to Europe and uh, Russia, all over the world, who now are going back and forming these contact teams so that there is a presence on earth of humans saying we would like to make peaceful contact with these civilizations we are willing to do this openly as citizen diplomats from earth to the cosmos and so we call this training ambassadors to the universe because it's about stepping into our obligation and our sacred responsibility but also empowering people to see themselves as ambassadors to the universe and to create this time of universal peace because we're uh, you know now many decades into the space age and yet and we know that we've been visited i mean even the, the major governments of the world uh, the french government the vatican has stated that there's intelligent life out there what has been lacking is any kind of coherent uh, peaceful formal response and so until the rest of the world uh officially does this we have an obligation to do it and, and i think that what's what's interesting is that as we have been doing this and modeling this whole concept and developing these protocols over the last uh, 18 years this all started in 1990 and if you go and get the, the, the book hidden truth forbidden knowledge um you'll sort of see an account of of how i started this project and why um and, and all the experiences i had that's at the disclosureproject.org, uh, uh, you will see that this is something that's now gotten the attention of people in governments around the world, including major G7 countries who are reaching out to us about setting up a formal protocol within uh, governments in Europe to make open, peaceful contact because they're realizing that we have have a huge opportunity that's been missed here by either denying this and putting your putting the head in the sand, or by making it secret. It's a huge mistake that this was all made secret. That an opportunity for a more uh, enlightened people to uh, make contact has been lost, and it's been lost for many, many decades. And so we have about. Uh, 50 or 60 years to catch up and the way to do that is for the people to lead and if the people lead the leaders will follow and that's why it's so important for people to understand that while it's very interesting to hear and read about these sort of experiences what's more important is for people to say you know i can do this why don't i form a team of uh, you know four or five six people in my area learn these protocols experiment with them give them a chance see what happens and one of the profound effects of that, aside from letting these visitors from other interstellar civilizations know that there are people on this planet that are not wanting to just shoot them down and uh, uh, engage them in some sort of military encounter, but there are people here who want to create a peaceful relationship with these visitors uh, and a diplomatic, uh, mutually beneficial relationship that it creates within the morphogenic field, uh, what Sheldrake talks about, this morphogenic field of consciousness, the, the aware and awake universe, it creates the potential for that to happen on larger 
levels on, and eventually through our official um, leaders on this planet, which is now happening. I mean, for the last year and a half or two, we've had uh, very high-level discussions with a major G7 country that is moving in the direction of formally starting a long-term commitment to make open, peaceful contact with these uh, visitors rather than just chasing them with, you know, F-16 jets or, or you know, whatever they are. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a very big breakthrough, actually, and it's because of the research we've been doing for 18 years uh, now being recognized, but it's also because of the sort of mysterious effect of a lot of people doing something like this that then begins to affect the awareness, the thought process, the consciousness, and this is actually how you manifest a new uh, uh, level of evolution on this planet, is that you, you have to be in a state of consciousness that expands into uh, this higher state of consciousness. You then have the vision of it, and then you manifest it. And it's this manifesting process that we really teach at these uh, expeditions where people learn to be manifestors of this new world and of an, a totally new period in human history where we're living peacefully on this planet with advanced new technologies that uh, are free energy systems and anti-gravity systems and where we're living peacefully with these other civilizations throughout the cosmos. It's a big paradigm shift, and the more people get this and see it and begin to practice it, the more it, it pulls into the now this good potential future, because that's how you unfold the future into the now. And it... And in case somebody thinks that it's difficult to do, I mean, it always works. In at our trainings, we always have totally amazing things happen. And when we go out by ourselves, I, I have a group. I live in California, and I have a group that goes out to the coastal area, a little south of San Francisco. We've had some amazing events, and and one time, um, a, a, just a few women of us went um, to to a a remote site where one of the women lives in so southwestern Oregon, and just a few of us, it just you know, three or four people can manifest some amazing things. And this isn't just my group. This is everyone who gets together in a, we call them a small working group, and, and has been trained in this contacting ETs and consciousness. We always have amazing things happen. Yes, we do, and, and I think this is what's so wonderful is that we're getting reports from people. For example, within the last year, a group in the Quebec area of Canada that have a, a, found a place up near Lake Edward or Lac Edouard, as they call it um, in French, um, where they have had amazing contact. And in fact, one of the members of the team had recently been diagnosed with breast cancer, and they were doing one of these protocols, and they, one of these a kind of a golden red translucent orb came in to their circle and went up and down over her body. And when she went back uh, the following week to the doctor to have the surgery to take, have this uh, biopsy, uh, it was completely gone. She had been completely healed of this, and people find this astonishing. And I can say, well, actually, it, it is something that is not that uncommon, that people have amazing experiences um, once they understand the potential of making open contact with these visitors and uh, the people who are doing it. And of course, I, I wasn't involved with that. It's not at all dependent on uh, me being there. Uh, in fact, I think because there's so much military and intelligence uh, community monitoring of what I do, you, once you learn how to do it, you're probably better off if I'm hidden under a rock somewhere. <laughs> but um, I say that only half-jokingly. And, and I think that what's interesting is that we have this amazing um, uh, growing uh, uh, group of people all over the planet who are doing this, and that is what is creating the sea change. Um, because when you go into, when you use this new mantra meditation that we've just shared with the world that is really one of the most powerful techniques uh, you will ever experience, I'll just be really honest with you, that when, and you experience this state of, of quiet, unbounded mind, and then you do that in a group of people with the intent of, uh, without fear and prejudice, making contact with these visitors, inviting them there in this spirit of universal peace, and you begin to have these experiences, it awakens that potential within every 
person on the planet, including our leaders. And, and this is why we're finding that there are all kinds of people in uh, very significant walks of life in government and, and other circles. Um, in fact, there's a, a, a people who are surfacing within the corporate world and governmental world and international relations and uh, even people who are friendly from some of the foreign governments, uh, overseas governments um, uh, in Europe who, who are in the military, who really want to break with this tradition of secrecy and denial and militarism that has been the huge mistake of the last 50 or 60 years in dealing with the extraterrestrial visits to Earth and start a new period of, of peaceful, open contact. And so, it, you know, it's the old thing of, of the swords being uh, beat into plowshares, where, you know, uh, uh, these sort of uh, institutions that have enormous resources and skill, I might add, uh, want to begin to use them for something beneficial. And this is a very encouraging sign, by the way, um, because I don't view anyone as not being able to understand this. And I think that one of the big problems in our society is that everyone has bought into the uh, deliberate uh, propaganda that's been put out there since the 1950s about some sort of threat from outer space. And we know that uh, uh, no less a figure than Werner von Braun, who uh, invented the rocket for Hitler and who then became the uh, core of our space program, the United States, and worked on the Apollo program and, and built the Saturn uh, rocket that took uh, the first man to the moon, that, that what you find is that uh, you know, he, on his deathbed, basically told his uh, assistant at the time, one of our witnesses, uh, Dr. Carol Rosen, that, that there had been a long-term plan to uh, misinform and disinform people and to create a false or hoaxed, a false flag operation around a threat from outer space, a so-called alien threat, and that a lot of people in the military and in the political establishment who do know about this subject have been brainwashed with this kind of nonsense, and that the public through Hollywood making movies at the request of the intelligence community and television shows and books and what have you have been completely brainwashed about this. And the purpose of all that brainwashing and propaganda is to make people afraid where there's nothing to be afraid of. And, you know, I, I point out to this to people that, you know, there is um, a basic law in the universe, and that is uh, there's no way a civilization is allowed to go outside of their biosphere, much less their solar system, to another civilization until they have become uh, a peaceful civilization. That, there, that this is something that is enforced universally, and that a lot of people hear about various aspects of the so-called UFO phenomenon. And I go, well, there are two parts of the UFO phenomenon, the extraterrestrial vehicles, which is what the National Security Agency had called them for years, ETVs, uh, with um, EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities, and then there are the ARVs, the alien reproduction vehicles, which are these man-made uh, flying saucer thingies that are, have rivets and seams and everything like this who, that are, quite frankly, um, to be honest, uh, made by Lockheed Skunk Works and Northrop uh, Grumman, uh, my uncle's old company. My uncle designed, uh, was this senior project engineer who built the lunar module, put the first man on the moon. And, you know, these kind of clandestine projects dealing with anti-gravity and propulsion and what have you, these have been built and experimented with since the, the late 50s and 60s uh, to, and operational. Uh, it's interesting because recently a very famous and uh, wonderful uh, film uh, producer uh, and director who is uh, in, well known throughout the world, very very famous, uh, and a wonderful man. I don't want to name him by name because you know we've been having just confidential conversations. But he was telling me about uh, being uh, out west, and he had had a sighting of a real ET craft uh, uh, that was this luminous, beautiful, peaceful, just gorgeous thing. And then later, I had had an, an encounter with one of these uh, riveted seemed obviously man-made anti-gravity things out in Utah. And, you know, he was sort of saying, you know, he instantly knew that something wasn't right, that that was not the same sort of E.T. craft that he had seen uh, years before. And, th and this uh, 
alien reproduction vehicle uh, was actually uh, this was in the 1970s when he saw this. And so, and I go, oh yes, that's the 30 years ago. But remember, we've had him for at least 50 years. And he went, oh my God, you know. I say, yeah, we've been building these things. And I said, and this is, you know, one of the real problems is that they have used a lot of really advanced technologies to hoax uh, fake alien encounters to scare the bejeebies out of people. And the real ET manifestations have been these beautiful, peaceful, wonderful things. And they have been trying to cover up the real extraterrestrial presence with this um, drama that's completely man-made by the intelligence community and the uh, classified world because they want people to have another enemy to fight. You know, they eventually want to expand the conflict going on Earth into space. This is what the whole Star Wars initiative is about, and weaponized space. And uh, this, this is one of the great tragedies of the 20th century that very few people know about, and that is the untold billions, if not trillions of dollars clandestinely that have gone into these projects since the 50s uh, that Eisenhower warned us about when he said, beware the military-industrial complex. And he said this because he knew about the ET issue, but he also knew he had lost control over the corporate and financial interest in this and their desire to uh, create a, a sort of a, a false flag operation around an alien threat, but also that they had taken these technologies and made them very secret, put them in the uh, contracting corporations and hidden them under trade secrets and everything else. Uh, when, you know, these are the technologies that could have gotten us off of uh, coal and gas and oil uh, back in the 50s. Uh, you know, it's like the, the Jetsons were not where it's a cartoon, but the actually what it was portraying in those cartoons were, were actually fully operational by the time the cartoons were made. And, and the irony, of course, now, uh, and the tragic irony, I might say, is that now there's this big debate and, and sort of awakening in the world that, gee, you know, we're destroying the biosphere with, with fossil fuels and we're uh, – in a financial collapse because of this house of cards we've created and the solution is already on the planet so one of the things we have to do is a few intelligent things you know we have to first form these contact groups that are citizen diplomacy groups to make open peaceful contact with these visitors we have to bring out the science and technologies that have been kept hidden away for decades that could replace oil and gas and coal, and we know they exist. We can prove they exist. Um, and we have to then reform or transform our whole uh, civilization away from the zero-sum game of uh, the petrodollar-based uh, economic system we have that requires that 80 percent of the world be in poverty and into a world of justice and abundance and a truly high-tech world. You know, people think we're so advanced and high-tech, and we could have been. But, you know, it's true that we have computers and, and integrated circuits and fiber optics, but they're all being run on coal-fired power plants or what have you, which is, you know, 1800s-era technology. And so uh, we have got to make this big leap because it's been thwarted and it's been suppressed and resisted for 50, 60 years or more. And the consequences of thwarting the natural evolution of a planet and a, and a people is the disaster that we're facing today, not just economic and social, but entire biosphere disaster and, and what have you. And so this is why it's so important that people get behind not only the CSETI effort to create these teams and, and volunteer to be an ambassador to the universe and set up your own contact um, team wherever you may be living uh, and if you can join us on one of these expeditions we do them four or five times a year it'd be wonderful um, but if you can't you can get all the training materials on the website and, and that's right and we hear from people all the time who've never been on a training they've simply gotten our materials from the website and had amazing contact on their own Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, we hear from on a daily basis. And so, you know, this is something you absolutely can do and should because it really makes a difference. And it to, begins to tell these visitors that there's another, uh, uh, there's another consciousness dawning on the planet uh, that's moving away from targeting these visitors with weapon systems or hoaxing scary encounters 
uh, and hoaxing abductions and all this sort of thing, uh, which are a hoax, by the way, um, this, and, and, and into another level of understanding that's much more uh, enlightened and much more sophisticated, and I should also add, much more truthful, um, that we've been able to cut through all the noise and nonsense and now we're able to move forward sort of out of that uh, mess and into a, a new understanding. And, uh, of course, that's what we're doing with the orionproject.org is, is to then put together the scientists uh, that are uh, wanting to come forward and work together and create the new energy systems uh, that we know have been developed in, with our tax dollars, I might add, uh, for you know decades to bring them out to benefit the world uh, and to transform the world from one that's hurtling towards oblivion environmentally and geoeconomically, but also uh, that would enable us to live in a way that allows abundance to, to be universal, education to be universal, uh, and to have the information that the people need to, to live in a dignified way so that they can get on with the process of, of evolution on this planet as a people as opposed to you know the kind of superstition and ignorance that dominates the world today. And, and this is really what this transformation, we're moving into this a new cycle, a whole new era in the evolution of Earth and, and humanity. And it is about that. It's about an entire new era where there will be a, a, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of unbroken peace and universal peace and abundance, and uh, that we will become travelers amongst the stars. But in order to do that, we have to live together peacefully. We have to live together honestly. We have to quit lying to each other about all these things. And we have to be smart enough to study it and awaken to what, what is really going on uh, so that we're not deceived again and again and again by people who benefit from some massive uh, geoeconomic war machine uh, that keeps creating all these problems and conflicts and, and creates the next boogeyman that everyone should be uh, rallying around to fight. And, and I think that this is why the CSETI uh, ambassador to the universe program is so important, is that people are, are really learning how to be uh, dignified ambassadors to these other civilizations, and then they go and begin to experiment with it, and they have these astonishing experiences that happen um, that confirm to them that not only that these ETs are very much around and present and wanting to interact with us, but that they are wanting to have Earth-based partners in this effort. And that, you know, it's not as if they're going to land on the White House lawn and say, here, change your civilization. And a lot of people, I remember Larry King asking me that question and, and when I was on his show, and I said, you know, look, Larry, uh, you know, <laughs> first of all, they'd be blown out of the sky. And secondly, it, this is not their place. It's not the place of the, these visitors to force anything. That's not their way. I mean, it, that wouldn't be any more successful than us, you know, invading Iraq and expecting that civilization to suddenly become a Jeffersonian democracy. I mean, it's just ludicrous. So we have to make this transformation from within ourselves uh, as a people. But we also need to begin to have some p uh, pioneers um, who are on the front lines of making open, peaceful contact, who can cut through all the deception, all the false flag uh, saber rattling and fear mongering of the uh, UFO abduction subculture that has been set up, by the way, since the 50s uh, by people at the CIA and elsewhere to uh, scare the hell out of people. And, and, and cut through all that, that childish nonsense and step into a whole new time. And that's what people can do and, and are doing in large numbers. And I think the more that people do this, the more that it will signal to these extraterrestrial visitors that we're ready for contact, more and more open contact. And uh, I think this will also support the process within the consciousness for this uh, major G7 country that has approached us to um, make the decision to initiate uh, these protocols on an official basis, and that's what they're asking us to work with them on. Um, and I have a letter from uh, the Ministry of Defense of this country that's one of the most important letter ever written on this subject, I might add, uh, that states quite bluntly that they want to make a long-term commitment on this journey together, uh, making contact with these visitors. 
So I think that this is a really big development, and it's being supported by people who get it and get the fact that the more that people do this, the more it creates the support within the field of non-local awareness within universal consciousness for it to happen and manifest. And that's how things change. That's really how evolution happens on this planet. And you've explained to us at trainings before how uh, humanity right now is is right at a very dangerous point in our evolution because our technological prowess has far surpassed our spiritual development. And this is the point at which civilizations before us on Earth have destroyed themselves. And that the ET civilizations incorporate their spirituality and consciousness into their science. It, it's, it's one, whereas we on Earth have always separated those two things. And we need to get to the point that the ETs are at, not only to communicate with them, but, but to learn how to, how to handle our technologies in a peaceful way. That's right. And I think that that's why um, that more people doing this not only creates that uh, morphogenic field to support open contact, but it really does affect people that you can't even imagine because it's sort of like meditation and prayer generally. It doesn't take everyone doing it, but a very, very small percentage of people engaging in some sort of very positive, highly conscious, cosmically aware activity, and it can alter uh, the entire process uh, of of the direction of the planet. Uh, And that's what has to happen, and so we ask people to join us in that effort and to join us if they they can have time on these expeditions um, out under the stars together uh, because they will learn to be expert remote viewers. They will learn to be expert meditators. uh, They will learn what to do uh, out under the stars and and how to be truly an ambassador to the universe. So that's uh, that's all something that, that is an ongoing project. And a lot of people wonder... You know how that that connects to these uh, you know environmental and energy projects that we're working on, and I said, well, it's all part and parcel of the same issue, is that we cannot just have uh, new technologies that create an energy system and a new economic system if we stay webbed, uh, stuck uh, with our feet in in this old paradigm of conflict, and that we have to be able to move uh, decisively away from. Uh, you know, uh, viewing this as an us versus them world to the essential oneness of all intelligent conscious life and and living together peacefully and pursuing uh, work and policies that that manifest that kind of world that is peaceful and just and abundant. Uh, And that is what has to happen within that consciousness, but that has to include not just Earth at this point. It's going to include these other civilizations because newsflash, they're here. And uh, everyone in senior ranks of government that I've met with acknowledge that. But there hasn't been an action plan to deal with this properly. And, um, you know, I I have told this uh, story in my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, when some years ago my wife and I went out, uh, I was doing a briefing for the Board of Noetic Sciences in uh, California, and uh, there was a uh, very famous uh, U.S. Senator there, Claiborne Pell, and Senator Pell. If anybody went to college on a Pell grant, they would think, you can thank Senator Pell for that. And he's a wonderful man, Senator from Rhode Island. And he was at this meeting that night, um, and we were out under the stars on this uh, this beautiful home up on a hilltop, right next to um, uh, the the uh, uh, ranch from the Star Wars, uh, the man. George Lucas. Started. Yeah, George Lucas's ranch, and um, and and uh, I was out there, and we he was talking about the fact that he had suspected these things were going on, but that he had never Senator Pell had never been able to find out any information on it uh, officially. And I said no, but I just I know I briefed the CIA director and you know uh, uh, President Clinton, all these people, and, and they were in the same boat, and so was President Carter. So you know you're in good company. But he said, well, would would, would you come? And, and brief my staff on that. I said, sure, any time we can set that up, I'd be happy to. And I'll send you all the materials that we've given to the president and to the CIA director. Well, at that point, I looked at him and I said, you know, because he had been in Congress since, I don't know, the 50s or 60s. I said, you know, Senator, you're the, you're the chairman of foreign relations for the Senate, the most powerful upper chamber body of the most powerful government in the world. 
and you have been deprived of dealing with the ultimate foreign relations issue. And I pointed to the stars above our heads. And he looked at me through his horn room glasses and blinked and said, well, Dr. Greer, you know, you might be right. I said, well, I am. And it was this poignant moment with a tinge of tragedy to it that here was this man who epitomized noblesse oblige, who was a, a wonderful person who really did care about the nation and, and what have you and was noted for being very bipartisan and high-minded and, and who was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee who had been denied access to the, even the information that we were being visited, and he knew it. And, and so here I, I, look, I, I saw him, and then I have subsequently met with the Honorable Paul Hellyer, who is head of the Ministry of Defense in Canada, and I have met with Ambassador Jim George of Canada, who helped bring the Dalai Lama out to the West, who is a very good friend of mine and on our team, and Amb- Ambassador John McDonald, who had worked with President Carter, uh, and all these wonderful, enlightened people who could have been on a senior contact committee representing the earth visualize that from all over the world um and yet instead this was stuffed into a black box this whole matter and it was taken over by militarists who then started shooting these extraterrestrial spacecraft down so they could study them and try to steal their technology so it's a little bit like the movie the day the earth stood still where you know these visitors came in peace and humans uh, hyper-reacted in this sort of paranoid military way, and, and it ended up being a disaster. So I think that, I think that, you know, that movie from 1951 or whenever it is, um, it, it was sort of a cautionary tale. And unfortunately, in the last uh, 57 years, we pretty much have played out that uh, movie, and it's become real uh, cinema verite. But the point being that we need to change that dynamic, and luckily we're seeing a major G7 country and their Ministry of Defense committing to, to making open contact peacefully and more and more people coming forward. And the reason that's happening is because people like you who are listening on the World Fusion Network are going, uh, you know, maybe I should be doing this. Maybe there would be some huge effect that could happen in the world by me and four or five or six or eight people getting together, learning to these protocols, doing the deep meditation, making contact, because it would then create the uh, hundredth monkey effect around the world, this morphogenic field shift that would recruit the, the whole planet into a new paradigm that would establish a new way of viewing uh, life in the universe that's peaceful uh, and without prejudice and without fear and that is really what this is all about. And, and I think that in that context, then we can safely talk about anti-gravity technologies for our propulsion systems. We can get rid of uh, jet airplanes that are destroying the biosphere. Uh, we can get rid of the internal combustion engine in cars. We can get rid of all the power plants that are belching out uh, the junk from coal and the waste from nuclear power plants. We can move on to a whole new true high-tech society living together peacefully and that's uh, worthy of going out into space peacefully. And so this is the, this is the big transformation and the big paradigm uh, shift that has to happen uh, over the next a few years. And it should have really done, made this sort of leap about 50 years ago. It's been delayed, but you know what? I wasn't around then. All I can say is that now is the time. There is a growing awareness of this, and, and there's enough Uh, signs in the earth, if you will, uh, in terms of the environment and the earth, Gaia speaking to us, and a society having serious problems and and financial problems, uh, that uh, people should understand that we're not going to solve the problem from the level of consciousness that created it, as Einstein said. We're going to have to bring up a whole new paradigm, a whole new consciousness uh, and and perspective, and uh, that's what we're proposing, and uh, we invite people to, to study what we're doing and and join us to the extent that they they can. And not only joining us in consciousness, but but um, supporting the Orion Project dot org. Check out that website because it's it's all about energy technologies that the world needs so badly right now that it would it would give hope it would give hope to people in this time really one of the worst times we've been in in my lifetime, and and also it would totally change the planet right 
Exactly. And you know, there, we hope to have some uh, breaking news. We have just learned uh, that uh, the uh, water to fuel Stan Meyer equipment uh, was actually tested at the request of the British royal family by an admiral uh, in Great Britain, uh, and that they did confirm that it was seven times over unity, seven times more energy out than in, and, and that that the vehicle that he had uh, that you can see on our website at uh, the orionproject.org really was running only on water, and that uh, we are in the process of trying to acquire all of that equipment uh, that has been in storage since Stan Meyer passed away. There's another group trying to bid with it. Uh, we're now having to go up to $80,000 to um, acquire this, and then we'll have to spend many times that to actually uh, get it secured and, and have a scientific team study it. Um, and so we ask people to help us uh, be sure that this technology doesn't uh, disappear into another effort because I, I'm quite certain that the other folks who are trying to get it do not have the strategic uh, contacts that we have that would enable this technology to get up and functioning and then out to the world rapidly. Um, we have, for example, just had a a very green company in Europe that is a, a multi-billion dollar multinational that uh, works very much on the climate change issue that has contacted us wanting to help us uh, and to use their resources to help disseminate this technology all over the world. This is a major, major event that's just happened in the last few days. Um, and I think that we're going to have to uh, secure these technologies, and but this is just one of several very key projects uh, that we are uh, pursuing. But unfortunately, you know, we thought that initially it would be forty or $50,000 to acquire all of that equipment. There's another person that's now bid it up to 80000 and I think that we're going to have to have the public help us with that. So uh, please do help us at theorionproject.org so that that amazing technology that Stan Meyer had developed and that had been tested and confirmed by a scientific team headed up by a British admiral, we have just learned today of this, um, that this uh, is not lost to posterity, that it's not uh, just lost forever again. Uh, it's been in storage for 12 years. It's time that it be brought out to the world, and I'm sure that we should be uh, the ones to do that, but we cannot do it unless we have the resources. So p please uh, help us, uh, those of you who are listening, uh, and go to the orionproject.org to learn more about that because we have a whole section on there about the Stan Meyer technology and the entire concept of using um, oscillating megahertz uh, electronic systems to uh, disassociate water into hydrogen and oxygen so that you could run your car and your home on, on just that with no pollution. The only pollution uh, emission would be water vapor, which could be recaptured, recondensed, and, and used to, to, to further the process. And the time is ripe for, for something like that. Oh, yeah, the time is right, and, and the strategic uh, list of people that are now uh, jumping on board uh, are very significant. As soon as we get one of these systems up and running, uh, we have a very close member of our team who have very good uh, contacts to both uh, John McCain and Barack Obama to be able to make a sit-down meeting happen and demonstration happen. And so, you know, it, it, we really have to be able to get a group of engineers together to build these systems up. And you just simply can't do that without the resources and the funding, and that's why we're asking people to generously donate uh, to our nonprofit, uh, the orionproject.org, working on these technologies. And those of you interested in these uh, contact uh, expeditions, please go to CSETI, that's CSETI.org, um, and uh, see what we're doing, and uh, join us at the Joshua Tree in November if you're free. and uh, It'll be, I think, a life-changing experience for anyone who, who comes. Absolutely. Well, I think we've run out of time. Thank you, Linda, for your uh, help and sharing with everyone. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. It's brought to you by the World Puja Network, and I very much wish to thank the people at the World Puja Network for their generous support and giving us this time to, to give an update to everyone. And I look forward to speaking with everyone again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.